be the coordinator of this coalition together with my colleague Yasmin Kursi, also from FGV Law School, uh, who will also be so kind to co-moderate this session uh, with me. So the, before we start and introduce our distinguished uh, panelists, we have an impressive set of speakers as every year discussing with us today. Uh, let me just share a couple of uh, introductory uh, thoughts about uh, our work and uh, what we aim at doing with this session and what we have been doing over the past year, right? Uh, so as you know, uh, coalitions of the IGF, they are, uh, they have this peculiarity of working uh, on an intersessional way, right? So we have been working on platform responsibility since 10 years, uh, well, almost 10 years, nine years to be precise. And we have uh, coined the term platform responsibilities eight years ago. And since then we have really endeavored to uh, analyze the impact of uh, private orderings, regimes of platforms on human rights, on democracy, on the evolution uh, of economies. And uh, we have debated and emphasized uh, constantly the great role that platform play and uh, the, the, the responsibility they have in respecting human rights. However, uh, there are uh, some obstacles that become, become quite evident when we uh, try to get into the details of how platforms have to respect human rights. Uh, now, this, the, the session of today aims precisely at tackling two key issues. On the one hand, we will analyze some ongoing regulatory initiatives that will, uh, will uh, make us understand what are the tensions, the regulatory tensions that are existing and what are the, uh, also the ways on which these tensions can be reconciled. Uh, and that is the second main point of today. We are going to present this outcome uh, document that we have elaborated, dedicated to uh, a meaningful and uh, interoperable transparency for digital platforms, where precisely we try to uh, define what are the elements that may make transparency a key, a core element of platform governance as something that could be even standardized, that could be legally interoperable or at least semantically interoperable amongst different jurisdictions, different players and different jargon of different stakeholders. So uh, in a very good example of how this is very relevant and very thorny issue is actually if we think about uh, content moderation and content regulation in social media. Uh, on the one hand, we have uh, daily examples of why content regulation is absolutely needed, uh, from starting from the weaponization of uh, harassment and disinformation uh, to manipulate democratic processes or to uh, harass uh, uh, with violent online content, specific individual, political opponents, minorities, and how this online violence then translates into offline violence. And but the problem is that we, uh, while we know that, the, that governments have a duty to protect human rights and platforms have a, uh, a, a responsibility to respect them and they jointly have to, to, to provide remedies, effective remedies. It's very difficult to put this in, in practice also because there, is, there are strong incentives, to be honest, both for many governments and many platforms uh, not to bear their responsibility, not to fulfill their duties and responsibilities. Many governments uh, thrive thanks to uh, sharing this information and we have seen especially this during the pandemic. Uh, and many platforms have a very strong economic interest in not regulating that much. And both have uh, fear, very strong fear of being considered censors when they regulate content. And that is neither good for elections, for government, not very good for businesses because it reduces engagement and therefore the, main, the core business of platforms uh, collect, uh, stimulating 
sharing of information, sharing of data and monetizing them, at least a large platform. So the, 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 one of the key elements that have been stressed and maybe is the only constant element that we find in almost all in regulatory initiatives to regulate platforms is transparency, the need for transparency. And transparency is essential for accountability. The problem is that if everyone defines transparency in different ways and does not explain what transpar meaningful transparency means, then it's meaningless to have commitment to transparency if everyone can decide uh, what uh, the platform will be transparent about and how. So the key uh, reason of having elaborated over the past months this uh, document on towards meaningful and interoperable transparency for digital platforms is precisely to start giving a suggestion, proposal on how to standardize transparency to make sure that there is not only meaningful information about how content is moderated within terms of service, but also meaningful information about uh, how automatic algorithmic moderation functions, which is the most relevant form of moderation in platforms, and also how users can have agency on it, eventually opt out or tackling how this is organized. And also it is, we have, been stressing over the past years, and uh, we will hear also from, from Nick, that is one of, has been one of the most vocal scholars uh, uh, stressing this, qualitative, this quantitative sorry, data alone, quantitative data alone about takedowns is not enough. We need qualitative data. It's in, useless to know that, we, that uh, a platform takes down 1,000 content if we do not know how many content have been signaled, which content have, in, have been taken down, which content is flagged, what majors are available. And no regulator has this kind of information. So it is also essential to make this kind of information auditable and accessible by uh, uh, independent regulators, but also by independent researchers. And all these elements, we have tried to uh, merge them, consolidate them together into this, the outcome report of this year. And they are all based on research that many of us have been conducting over the past year, and many uh, other scholars, very distinguished scholars, uh, ha have also been uh, advocating for over the past year. So we really hope that this will be a useful starting for point for discussion and useful suggestions. Now, without further ado, I would like to uh, just pass uh, the mic to my colleague, Yasmin, for a little bit of introduction, and then we can start with the lively part of the discussion with our speakers. Yasmin, the floor is yours. Many thanks, Luca. Hi, everyone. So I'd like to welcome you all to this year of the, the CPR issue. As Luca mentioned, entitled Platform Responsibilities in Times of Conflict. Uh, so in this session, we aim to find paths to explore how platform regulations are affecting internet fragmentation worldwide. Uh, our understanding is such regulations may be causing negative externalities for both for users and law enforcement. Some examples, as Luca mentioned, are data concentration, censorship, conflicts of jurisdiction and others. Uh, in this session, so our aim is to explore how platform governance may improve the current scenario. Uh, we've invited our stellar speakers to discuss possible guidelines to orient policymakers in creating a more trustworthy and inclusive digital environment that may be able to foster user control uh, and also interoperability. So without further ado, I would call to the floor Mr. Oli Bird. Head of International Policy at Ofcom to initiate our discussion with his remarks. Thanks, Oli. Good to have you here. Thanks. Yes. Sorry. I just I just was just reminding the technical assistance to unmute the speakers when we call their names. Thank you very much. Thanks, Luca, and thank you, Yasmin, and, and thank you to all those who um, who fed into this year's um, this year's output, the um, uh, the 2022 um, outcome document, which I think is a really useful one that that sheds light on a number of important aspects. Um, I was going to just make some brief remarks from um, the perspective of a regulator. So, uh, just to introduce myself, my name is Ollie Bird. Um, I'm from Ofcom, which is the UK 
communications regulator. Um, I've been following this dynamic coalition and involved in some other multi-stakeholder conversations around platform governance, uh, such as through the Internet and Jurisdiction Policy Network. Um, I wanted to speak briefly about some aspects of platform responsibility, uh, fragmentation and interoperability from the perspective of an independent regulator that is already engaged in platform regulation um, through different different regimes, including a limited online safety regime, but we are we are preparing for further more comprehensive duties. Um, just to introduce Ofcom a little bit for those of you who are not um, who are not familiar with us, uh, we are the UK Independent Converged Communications Regulator. Um, we uh, regulate some aspects of online, for example, net neutrality, uh, the European Audiovisual Media Services Directive. Um, has created a regime that applies to, uh, to Ofcom in the UK uh, because it was implemented um, just before Brexit and that sees the regulation of, um, of user-generated content um, on video sharing platforms. Many of you will um, be familiar with the UK discussions around the broader online safety bill, which is which is still um, which is still uh, being debated in Parliament. Um, I think. I'd like to emphasize at the outset the growing role of independent regulation in the platform governance space. Um, independent regulators can play a distinct role from governments, um, bringing detailed technical expertise to secure outcomes on behalf of users, uh, or as we say in the UK, citizens and consumers, um, reflecting a broader understanding of user than just a consumer of services in, in, in an economic or financial sense, um, bringing in broader dimensions like human rights and, uh, and democracy. Um, independent re regulators are often asked to balance considerations such as freedom of expression and protection from harm. And uh, good regulators are evidence driven and use public consultations to enable broader input from a wide range of expert stakeholders to make sure they've got things right. So um, I think it's something we're, we're trying generally to uh, promote the understanding of this role of independent regulation. When I, whenever I register for the IGF, I have to choose between um, government and uh, technical community, and I'm never sure which one, because um, I, um, I think Ofcom and, uh, and other regulators lie, lie somewhere in between those two things. Um, so uh, I mentioned that the UK government is currently proposing a broader online safety regime, um, but uh, I don't I don't propose to go into that because it's still uh, before the Parliament and, and Ofcom will operate within whatever legal framework Parliament then uh, creates. But it's but it's not for us really to uh, to make the law. Um, but uh, at, at the global level, we do see a gradual uh, proliferation of national legal regimes for platform regulation of different types. Um, and I think there is some global convergence of, of uh, regulation for certain purposes, notably um, CSAM and perhaps terrorist content hate speech. Um, but I think the picture is that national regimes will, will inevitably diverge. Um, they're always going to be the product of national discussions and uh, debates with particular concerns and local circumstances. So I think therefore there is, as you as you identify in your in your document, the risk of fragmentation um, at the level of platforms and services which may be brought about by these by these different um, divergent national uh, regulation um, uh, uh, approaches. Um, but I think there is an evolution at the same time and that is away from regimes that focus on notice and takedown of certain types of content with enforcement around timelines, timeframes, and um, uh, towards a perhaps a more um, sophisticated regulatory approach, which is more focused on the systems and the processes of platforms. Um, so in the UK, we've called this uh, a duty of care. Uh, and I think the DSA in, in, in the EU takes a similar approach. Um, and so it's about having regulatory objectives that are in line with the objectives that platforms should have for themselves and about regulation, making sure that platforms are designing their products, their systems and their processes to achieve 
these shared goals. So the idea is for platforms to be taking uh, responsibility themselves with, with, with uh, regulatory oversight of that. And this new type of regulation will require a new regulatory toolkit, which includes things such as risk assessments, um, provisions for transparency, audit and uh, reporting by platforms. And I think it is here that there is considerable scope for collaboration amongst regulators, because even if the national regimes differ, um, the underlying uh, regulatory toolkit can be developed um, between, between other regulators and, and be common um, across different regimes. Uh, and this is why Ofcom has jointly founded the Global Online Safety Regulators Network with our counterparts in Australia, uh, Fiji and Ireland, and we held a session earlier today that um, maybe some of you were able to join. Uh, we're happy to happy to talk more about that if you weren't, and we really are keen through that network to engage with a broad range of um, global stakeholders. Um, so I think this approach that sees that sees this kind of collaboration at the global level can help avoid some of the fragmentation at at the regulatory level um, nationally. Um, a, a final point I'd make is that there's a need for dialogue as well, I think, between regulators engaged in, in different adjacent regimes in the digital space. Um, so for example, between uh, online safety regulators, data protection authorities, competition authorities. And in the UK, we've pioneered this through the uh, DRCF, which is the Digital Regulation Cooperation Forum, um, founded by those three, uh, those three authorities in the UK. Um, and we've seen, for example, a recent statement uh, jointly between Ofcom and the UK's, uh, uh, UK's ICO, the Data Protection um, uh, Regulator. So I think in sum, these are, these are exciting times for, for collaborating on platform governance. Um, regulators are new to some of these conversations, but we're really keen to engage and um, work with others to minimize risks of fragmentation. That's me, thank you. Excellent, thank you very much, Oli. And now we go straight to the second speaker, uh, our good friend, Nicholas Suzer, who is member of the Oversight Board and also professor at Princeton University. And he has been with us in this coalition for many, many years. I, I think he is one of the uh, few that probably was at the first meeting of this uh, coalition. So a very uh, uh, hipster uh, <laughs> uh, title of being one of the founder of this, uh, co-founders of this coalition. And uh, Nicholas, you have a very good uh, uh, first-hand experience on how this type of regulatory proposals uh, will may play out and also how self-regulation plays out thanks to your role at the oversight board. So really we look forward to hearing from you. Please, the floor is yours, Nick. And I would like to ask the technical assistance to unmute Mr. Nicholas Suzer. Um, I was just wondering if you might indulge me for a moment, and um, assuming Emma is okay with this, um, I was going to talk a little bit about methods for analyzing transparency data, and I think it might actually be um, best if, uh, if Emma doesn't mind going next, because I think that she's going to talk a little bit about how we actually get data from platforms, um, and then I'll jump into where we might uh, go for in terms of method methodologies for analyzing. So you want you were going to switch with having Emma first, or uh, are you proposing? Yes. Okay. Okay. Wonderful. So we have uh, we have. Uh, we can go with Emma. Of course, we are very happy to have her. Uh, Emma also is a very good friend and also a, one of the uh, one of the uh, key participants to this coalition. And not only to this coalition, uh, I also have the pleasure to be with Emma in the steering uh, committee of the Action Coalition on Meaningful uh, Transparency. Uh, that is also another entity that has provided a lot of very interesting. Uh, uh, inputs 
and comments on the work of this year. And of course, Emma is the author of an, a fantastic paper on meaningful transparency, which has also been a very uh, interesting source of inspiration from our work. So please, Emma, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you so much, Luca. Um, and hello to everyone. I'm so sorry I can't be there in person with you, uh, but it's wonderful to see so many faces also on the Zoom. Um, so as Luca mentioned, uh, CDT has, done, my organization, the Center for Democracy and Technology, um, has done a lot of work over the years looking at transparency and how to make it more meaningful and useful in the overall project of trying to hold tech companies accountable for how their decisions and policies and practices um, and products affect our information environment and our human rights. Uh, and so in the uh, Making Transparency Meaningful framework that we uh, published about this time last year, we talked about um, four different areas that policymakers should really understand and consider around transparency. Um, to think about, we can often sort of put a lot of things under the umbrella of transparency, um, but there are at least four different ways you could think about uh, trying to get more information from companies and analyze it and use it um, to understand the impact that they're having on users' rights. The first being transparency reporting, um, a kind of regular standardized reporting or regular and periodic reporting that um, tech companies make about both government demands for access to user data or content restriction, as well as more recently their own content moderation and enforcement. Um, there's also, though, a really important kind of transparency of that, that notice to users, that information that is provided to users, whether it's in the form of written policies and practices, or especially that information directly to users when action is being taken against their content, or when they have flagged something and are waiting to know, has this problem that identify, I've identified been resolved at all? Um, that user notice is a really key kind of transparency that directly affects that kind of day-to-day -day interaction between the user and the online service. Um, and it can often get a little bit overlooked in conversations about transparency. Um, as uh, I think others have mentioned and, um, and as discussed in the, um, the, the framework that the Dynamic Coalition has put together, auditing is also really important. This idea of being able to go into the information that is published and not just sort of take it at face value, but understand and have procedures in place for understanding where does this information come from, how accurate, how reflective of the uh, company practice and experience on the platform um, is this information really. And that's going to be crucial to underlying all of the regulation that is coming um, because we need to sort of know if the information being provided really aligns with the actual practice and experience within these companies. Um, but then the piece that I really want to talk about today, and this is what uh, Nick previewed, um, is this whole question of researcher access to data. Um, so enabling independent researchers to have access to data, I really think is a, a crucial form of transparency. Um, we need independent research by scholars, by journalists, by civil society organizations in order to inform our public policy making, in order to make sure that we actually understand what's happening on online services, what effect different kinds of interventions have on addressing abuse or shaping our information environment. Um, and right now, as I'm sure Nick will be able to, to tell you um, even in more detail, it can be really hard to conduct that research. Uh, companies have obviously have the data. Um, they're the ones who are running the services that are kind of generating, um, creating the data and making it available is not always obvious or easy to do or um, like financially beneficial for, for companies to do and can actually create a lot of different kinds of risks for the companies that have this data. But it is really, really crucial for all of us to have this better informed discussion about what public policy we actually want to see happen um, around platform regulation. So one of the, the projects that CDT worked on this past year was uh, holding a research workshop with researchers from around the world, asking them some pretty key questions, fundamental questions like, what kind of data do you actually want? What sort of format for accessing or getting, um, you know, getting your hands on it could you actually use? There's a lot to explore around the difference between sort of 
data sets being published versus having ongoing access through an API where um, researchers can sort of set parameters for different kinds of studies or conduct ongoing studies or real time analysis of information. Um, and then a crucial question and something that a lot of regulators have already been um, starting to grapple with is the key question of who should get this data, who counts as a researcher, um, what kind of vetting needs to happen of researchers, if any? Um, should they have to be affiliated with some kind of accredited uh, institution, like a university or a research institution? Is it possible to make data available just completely broadly, no strings attached to the general public? Um, one of the big and probably pretty obvious trade-offs in the conversation about researcher access to data is concerns around privacy. Um, there are a lot of concerns around privacy, both in the sort of Cambridge Analytica style, you know, the idea that a researcher could gain access to a lot of information and use it for their own ends or potentially sell it to other individuals, um, use it in ways that are manipulative, not expected by users, um, and invade users' privacy in different ways. So the sort of threat from the private actor space um, is, is a pretty significant and, and known concern. Um, but then we also think at CDT that there is a, a real concern to be considered around how researcher access might um, potentially enable greater law enforcement access and government surveillance of individuals. And, and we have this concern in part because we've seen already with US law enforcement and law enforcement in some other countries around the world that different tools that third parties have used or have created to enable um, different sorts of analysis or understanding of what's going on on social media have in fact been used by law enforcement as ways to track people's social media activity, um, try to identify, you know, what organizations are involved in planning different sorts of activism or protest. Um, it can be an incredibly invasive kind of surveillance um, and something that I think any framework around thinking about researcher access really needs to, to take into account. Um, so as we're thinking about moving forward in all of this, I did want to flag a couple of different uh, initiatives where that are, are working on trying to assess these different um, trade-offs and, and come up with ideas of how to sort of bridge these gaps. One is the, the initiative that Luca mentioned, the Action Coalition on Meaningful Transparency. This came out of the um, Danish Summit on Tech and Human Rights, or Tech and Democracy, um, that was held last November, I believe, um, and, and launched a whole series of action coalitions trying to bring governments, uh, civil society, researchers, and companies together um, from around the world to really think critically about issues around technology and democracy and how the two can be mutually reinforcing rather than at ends and, and in tension with each other. So um, the Action Coalition on Meaningful Transparency is trying to be a, a sort of gathering place and a, a hub for information um, and all of the good work and research and um, efforts on transparency that are happening around the world to be a sort of central place where people can go and find that information um, and think through some of these different uh, different questions about how are different regulatory environments um, pursuing things like requiring or enabling researchers to have better access to data. Um, and then there's also an initiative that uh, just had a, a public um, launch and release of a, a kind of concept paper a few months ago called the Institute for Research on the Information Environment. And just very briefly, that is looking at trying to effectively see how we could model something after CERN, the, um, the nuclear research uh, laboratory um, and, and gigantic kind of <laughs> multinational initiative um, housed in Switzerland uh, that has with the home of the Large Hadron Collider and many other amazing kind of tools for enabling research into um, theoretical physics. That was a very particular style of collaboration that was really identified as necessary to enable a real uptick in research in physics um, and, and identify that there were sort of both resource needs and information sharing needs that were really crucial um, to, to kind of, excuse me, that were really crucial to help the whole field doing research in this area um, level up and, uh, <clears throat> sorry, <laughs> it's a lot of talking for very first thing in the morning. Um, so 
So anyway, a CERN for the information environment, um, and then the idea of that there really does probably need to be some kind of coordinated and international effort thinking about these questions of research around online platforms and the information environment because the resource constraints of everybody trying to roll their own version and do their own kind of approach to this um, could be uh, so high as to be sort of prohibitive. Um, so the last thing that I'll flag is that uh, there are some really kind of exciting opportunities around researcher access to data and other forms of transparency that are already getting underway. Um, these, I think, really come from the Digital Services Act and the European Union. So the, the DSA, which um, people are, have probably heard about or probably somewhat familiar with, has um, a lot of different kinds of transparency uh, in that regulation, including um, requiring different online services to produce transparency reports, to improve the notice that they give to users, to engage in auditing, and to um, require platforms to provide researchers with certain data um, to, in order to do research. So I would just flag for everyone that as we're thinking through how to kind of maneuver in this space and how to avoid fragmentation in this space, there will be a very active conversation in the EU around how to actually implement all of these provisions, and we'll be getting a lot of data out of companies as a result of the DSA. Um, all of that, I think, can be incredibly useful to informing ongoing policy conversations conversations, really kind of testing out what works and what doesn't, what kinds of approaches to auditing, ap approaches to researcher access will actually really um, work well and, and what lessons might we learn about what doesn't work as well. Um, and so I would kind of point to everyone to think about what is going on with the DSA implementation and really encourage policymakers in Europe in particular to be thinking, obviously it's a big task to get going just for the EU, but to be thinking about how the DSA potentially can serve as a model and a, um, a set of lessons to learn for the rest of the world so that we're not all having siloed conversations about how to implement these different kinds of transparency in regulation. Cool. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emma. Uh, I would just like uh, to make a few remarks about the uh, access of information, access of data. Uh, regarding the Global South perspective, there are several power imbalances that make, uh, that create pose obstacles for uh, Global South researchers to access data from platforms and also to uh, get involved with regulation proposals. So I think that the work of co transnational coalitions are super necessary and I'm really excited to hear more about the Action Coalition on Meaningful Transparency. Uh, without further ado, I would like to call to the floor Nick Suzer, Professor of the uh, University at University of Board. Thanks, Nick. Thank you. Oh, and sorry uh, again, uh, sorry uh, to interrupt, but the streaming on the YouTube is not working. Uh, people are complaining here. So if the technical assistance completes, uh, it would be good. Thank you. As far as I can tell, they've just been staring at a very bad still photo of me for the last uh, 10 minutes, um, which <laughs> Can't be pleasant for anyone, but uh, so we apologize for those technical problems. Look, I really want to follow up from the really important work that Emma was talking about here. Um, I think it's it's important to note that we have made really large inroads in transparency over the last decade or so, um, and. Emma in particular uh, has been really leading a lot of that fight uh, to convince platforms to make available regular transparency reports and uh, a lot more data than we historically had. The Where we are now, I think, is, is quite interesting. We're approaching the point where we need a lot more information than is available and the platforms are, are willing to give us from heavily curated transparency reports. Um, there are big challenges both on the sides of platforms and on the sides of civil society and academia to actually moving beyond um, where we are now to get to the point that Emma's talking about where we can have secure 
privacy respecting access to data on a granular enough level that it allows us to hold the actions of platforms to account and to understand how other actors are, and malicious actors in many cases are using platforms to uh, for nefarious ends. In many cases, platforms are quite reluctant to give us the information that is required to hold their actions into account. That's the first stumbling block. The second is platforms don't even, they do have a lot of data, but they're still uh, making improvements in the way that they're capturing information to be able to answer some of the questions we have. It's only been relatively recently that a platform can even tell you if your content is removed or you are suspended, which rule you have broken on the platform. For a very long time, that sort of information was not captured. Um, a moderator would make a decision according to one rule or another, which might be different to the reason that someone originally flagged um, a piece of content or that the particular machine learning classifier thought that there might be a problem. And so most of the major platforms weren't recording um, the, the information that's required to be able to report to us what rules that they are enforcing and what levels of accuracy they have against particular rules. Now, that is starting to improve, but there's still a bit of engineering work on platform side um, to continue to make sure that they can collect data and report data at a granular enough level. What concerns me next is what we're going to do with it. I think the questions Emma uh, is, is asking and the point that Yasmin makes about uh, making sure that we can get equitable access to data uh, in a form that is useful to be able to uh, help civil society try to hold platforms to account, I think is a huge resource and methodological challenge. As most platforms move more toward, most major platforms move more towards machine learning for the initial detection and the, of, of potential um, content breaches and the eventual enforcement, there's a real problem with where we are now with uh, the data that we've got. At the moment, the main metric for success amongst platforms is accuracy for their machine learning classifiers, right? Um, we have seen over the last few years with the global pandemic, a lot of major platforms have turned more towards machine learning classifiers to directly act on content. And the way that um, we are told how well these systems are working is with a flat number on accuracy, which, it, which when you start digging into it, actually means consistency. It, it is a measure of how well the content classifiers agree with the human moderators who used to do that job or who are doing um, content level appeals of that job. That's not accuracy. That is a measure that necessarily reflects existing biases in the system. Any machine learning system trained in the unequal world that we live in will learn the biases of that world. What that means is that we can expect, and we do in fact see, that the outputs of the classifiers the platforms are using uh, tend to perform much worse for marginalized uh, populations and vulnerable groups, groups where by definition there is less training data 
and there is uh, there there are fewer appeals and uh, less resources spent to uh, identify mistakes and correct for them. What that means in real terms is more silencing of counter speech of of people who are speaking back to power um, and more on the other hand permitting or, or not catching uh, false flagging and abuse that is directed towards disproportionately towards minority and marginalized groups we also know that marginalized groups are like people from marginalized groups are likely to have uh, more trouble dealing with, adapting to, fighting, trying to correct uh, incorrect decisions when they are made. Now, here we get to a challenge. We know all of this, and we know that we should expect this from the current iterations of the classification systems that platforms have put into place. We don't have a good way for measuring quantifying, let alone correcting for those sorts of challenges. For academics like me, there's a really big set of problems about how we would actually go about analyzing the outputs of classifiers and content moderation systems if we did have access to the data that we've been asking for. For a long time, it's been so hard to get the data. Now that we are starting to get a little bit of data, there's still a there's still a gap amongst researchers about how we can understand that information in a way that's useful, meaningful in in, in the words we've been using. And that's not aggregated statistics. We know that. The problem is that state of the art amongst machine learning communities at the moment is really about equalizing error rates within subgroups, which means you divide up your populations into demographics and you try to measure the rates of false positives and false negatives amongst those different groups. Now, this gets really tough. Um, one, it puts you immediately in ethically quite difficult position if you're a researcher of trying to guess, infer someone's characteristics from their content or their name or their pictures. And we've seen lots of examples of researchers getting that very horribly wrong. Um, and I think that consensus is starting to emerge that that sort of research probably um, is fraught at best and probably shouldn't happen in the vast majority of cases where people are using it. So then we need to think about how we go about um, working with communities to empower them to understand how platforms are operating. This is the big challenge. I think for academics in particular, this is where we need to really spend the time understanding the qualitative issues that are different for different communities, that different groups are, and intersectional groups are experiencing content moderation problems in quite different ways. For me, I think some of the promising ideas are around creating test sets, for example, of um, known counter speech or known commonly um, common false positives or false negative detection examples and starting to curate those in collaboration with the people on the ground to then be able to assess accuracy rates um, for the particular sets of content that we're talking about. And I think that's the key that we're not able to do this. So we're not able to do a lot of the evaluation we need to do at a generic level that 
race blind, gender blind approaches really don't help. You need to be able to work at a much more fine grained level um, in order to be able to understand properly the information that you're looking at. And we don't have the methods. We have the methods to be able to do very fine grained qualitative work. What we don't have so far is the ability to move between the very fine grained qualitative work and the large scale statistical work that platforms need in order to be able to um, make changes to their to their systems. I've got plenty more to talk about in terms of methodological challenges, but I'm going to I'm going to stop with one final point, which is I haven't even mentioned the huge challenge that Ollie spoke about at the start, which is now we're not even talking about uh, leave up and take down decisions, which we can see and measure as binary decisions. But we are looking about decisions to amplify or hide or make less visible. There are a lot of different terms for this, um, but it's decisions about upranking and downranking of content. Now, I got to be honest, I don't even know how to measure that. It's not like there is a neutral existing baseline for how content is distributed on the internet that you can measure up and down from there. Every Everything is always mediated. Platforms, by definition, amplify content by making it available to more people. We are, lots of people are concerned about upranking and downranking for many different reasons. And Ollie, if you've got time, I want to hear about what happens, what happened this week and, and where we are now with the, um, with the debate in the UK about what, platforms are expected to do, but we don't have consensus. We don't have social consensus about what we expect from platforms, but we know that we expect them to be doing something and we don't know how to measure what that something is. That is a massive challenge for academics once we, and civil society groups, once we do get the data that we've been talking about, uh, that we're all going to have to work together and particularly work with people on the ground who have first-hand experience in order to understand. Thank you very much, uh, Nick. Uh, very eloquent as usual. And I think there are a couple of points uh, that you are mentioning that are quite well reflected also in, in our outcome document, which is first, the need to uh, uh, stress uh, the importance of observability. So it's not only about having information, it's about having information that can be uh, meaningfully assessed, analyzed to, per, to reach some <laughs> meaningful conclusion. And again, what you were mentioning that uh, the, the, the possibility to analyze how uh, algorithmic moderation functions. So when content is 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 prioritized or downgraded the so-called shadow ban uh, uh, th th this is really uh, challenging for academics even if academics or regulators have the possibility to access this kind of data which is not the case so far it would be tremendously difficult for them to make sense of it and uh, this is uh, to while it is essential to have access in, in safe in safe environment about meaningful data to understand the functioning of moderation, it is also essential to invest in research on how to make sense on to, about those data because so far we neither have that access nor uh, the capability to make sense out of it. And uh, we are speaking about the calls for transparency when honestly, pretty much all regulators are uh, uh, walking in the darkness without understanding. Even if we had those data, they would not be able to understand properly uh, how to regulate, how to, 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 to uh, uh, make sure that their, their duty to have oversight on platform, on the regulated uh, 
uh, entities is fulfilled. So that is a major problem that we need really to solve. Uh, now, with this uh, big question, I would like to open for the first very quick round of questions. We have 10 minutes to, for a couple of questions uh, for the first set of panelists before we uh, go to the second set of, the, uh, of panelists. And we already have a question uh, from uh, Guy Berger, uh, who is also very, uh, very kindly uh, blogging about this session of Mastodon. So thank you very much, Guy, for this. And so his question is about, is directly to, to uh, Oliver and so to the news that recently emerged about uh, Ofcom now being uh, being obliged or at least in, uh, being uh, being uh, planning to consult the victims commissioner, the domestic abuse commissioner, and the children's commissioner, uh, were, when drawing the codes uh, that will regulate uh, platforms. And so, uh, how the, the question is how this process will be organized, how this con consultation will be organized, and uh, what will be also the relation with the elections management authority. This is a very long uh, and detailed question. Please, uh, Oli, you have the honor and pleasure to reply, to reply to this question. Yes, I think now we can, you can speak, now you have been un unmuted. Thanks, Luca. Yeah, sorry, just, just waiting for that. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Guy, for the question and, um, and, and Nick as well for your, for your point, um, which I think I, I, they probably have the same answer, which I'm afraid is a slightly boring one, which is that these are, these are details of the, of the latest um, government uh, proposals here that made to, made to the UK Parliament and um, Ofcom similarly is just starting to to understand and uh, digest them ourselves. So it's probably too too soon to kind of give you any any helpful or detailed comment about how those things might work, um, because I think we would we would want the parliamentary process to uh, conclude here and 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 then and then and then we'll be able to take a view on 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 what the regime would look like in in. Uh, in reality, um, but I think just just while I've got the microphone, maybe I could just pick up on on um, on Emma's point and Nick's as well about um, about uh, researcher access to data, which which I think we we think is really important. Um, it's um, it seems likely to be something that can play a uh, a pretty critical role in 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 a, in a future uh, world where there is meaningful um, transparency and accountability. Um, with a sort of regulated backstop for that, um, and we uh, we will be thinking more about this uh, at Ofcom because uh, the online safety bill in the UK um, has a has a proposal that Ofcom should should uh, make a report on research access to data um, within two years of the of the new bill becoming law. So this is uh yeah this is a very live issue for us and um we think it's a really important one and um doubtless we'll we'll uh, continue to talk to you guys and others about that thanks Luca. okay excellent we also have uh of course we have a request uh on uh, the what is the i mean to share the document so we can uh, share the, you, you can everyone can access the document that we were mentioning about uh, meaningful and interoperable and transparency on the IGF uh, website. So is the we can all, we also have as we perfectly know that the IGF website can be a little bit arcane and not really easy to access. Uh, we have also created a mini URL that which is uh, bit.ly uh, slash IGF twenty two plot. So it's IGF capital letters 22 uh, plot. And so you can access, everyone is very welcome to access the document and feel free to share it or to provide feedback. We will be very happy to hear your feedback. Uh, now I, we have- any, I yes. put it on the chat also. Okay. Excellent. I wonderful, put it on the wonderful. chat also, the link. Yes, wonderful. Thank you very much, Yasmin. And uh, do we have a, a, I think maybe there might be some, some questions from the floor. I know that some of you have put uh, questions in the uh, in the chat, but uh, as we are in a hybrid format, uh, and unfortunately, well, now we cannot see the, uh, the, the 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 
room at the IGF venue because it is still frozen, the video. So if there is anyone there willing to uh, share a quest to ask a question, please take the mic and introduce yourself. Do we have any questions? I see some, I hear some sounds, but I, I we, unfortunately we cannot see anything. So if there is uh, anyone, please introduce yourself and ask the question. I don't think there is anyone there. It looks like no one is asking questions now from the floor. So I think we can go on with the uh, second, uh, the second segment of the uh, of the uh, session with our first speaker of the second segment which is Vittorio Bertola head of policy and innovation at open exchange who is also going to uh, speak about uh, some of the latest european uh, developments especially with regard to interoperability and uh, the recent eu uh, policies that have been adopted or are in the pipeline so please Vittorio the floor is yours and I would like to ask to unmute Vittorio Bertola, please. Thank you. You, you can also uh, open my video if you want. So yeah, well, thank you for, for inviting me. And uh, yes, I wanted to address a little of the development in Europe, but first of all, I also wanted to uh, broaden a little the discussion, going a little beyond the content dimension and, and discussing the relationship between platform regulation and internet fragmentation, which is one of the main themes of this uh, IGF. And uh, because I, I think that there's, uh, there's been a lot of talk on how the states fragment the internet with internet shutdowns and censorship, and especially in authoritarian regimes, and this is also an important thing. But there is less talking of how platform regulation really is also a, an element of, of the struggle against internet fragmentation, and sometimes also in favor of internet fragmentation. So there are dimensions of fragmentation that that are actually positive in this regard. So, of course, the, the, there are multiple ways it, uh, through which uh, the, the big internet platforms, and I mean, the private sector in general, but mostly the big internet platforms, uh, tend to create barriers and fragment the internet. And, in, and of course, there's a lot of this happening at the, at the content level. So in two dimensions, I mean, sometimes the platforms uh, make agreements with governments of authoritarian regimes uh, to, to block stuff, actually. So search engines or social media make specific content, specific websites unavailable in specific countries just to be allowed and continue doing business there. And at the same time, it's also the opposite. So sometimes uh, the, the platforms tend to disrupt the national uh, rec regulations on content. And this is a problem, especially for what we have been discussing up to now. So if we want to introduce some degree of transparency or some constraints on the on the algorithms, on the mechanisms that the platforms use to, to control and, uh, and a prank or remove the content, then there, there must be a way for national jurisdiction to apply. And what happens is that increasingly there's, uh, the, there are, the, I mean, the, the platforms tend to build their own intense infrastructure in a way, even they, they build the encrypted channels from the devices, from the applications straight to the cloud servers, sometimes in a different jurisdiction. And so this way they bypass any kind of national content filter and even national regulation that might be imposed. And, and in the end, this leads to applying maybe the content values of, of the home country of the, of, of the platforms, or sometimes even the values of the single individual owner, as we are seeing now with Twitter, basically to the entire world. And, and so this creates a fragmentation which is not uh, anymore along the lines of uh, national states and national sovereignty, but along the lines of who is the owner of the individual platform. And, and, but then we, we have uh, the, what is when what has been maybe more concerning at the European level, especially not for the digital service sector, but for the digital market set, which is what I've been following more, more directly, which is fragmentation at the user experience level. And in the end, the, the very idea of an internet platform is becoming a, a mechanism for internet fragmentation because these platforms tend to build uh, closed ecosystems uh, under the form of walled gardens. So their business model is based on bringing people into a separate subset of the internet. And, and sometimes this, I mean, we do not even realize anymore how this uh, this thing is basically creating barriers through people and, uh, and across the internet. But if you, for example, if you have always used an Android phone and then go speak to an iPhone user and they dis and discuss how to use your phone, sometimes they mention doing things that you don't understand what they what they are because they, I mean, the, they, the interface really shapes the way you use the internet and the language you use to describe uh, maybe even the same functions, but, but they appear to be completely different. So this creates really 
a, a separation and fragmentation of, of user experiences in, in a way even of I mean of uh, the conception of the internet and, and this is especially visible also in terms of messaging apps so this is what what, what I also wanted to mention the, in Europe now we are busy with the uh, discussing at least the, the implementation of the digital market set which just be, became I mean finally low uh, a, a few weeks ago and, and this is an important discussion because there's been a lot of talk on how, which rules we should impose on the platforms, but there's not a lot of talk on how we can actually make sure that they are respected, they are implemented. And, uh, and this is not an easy thing, especially for regulators. Uh, I mean, sometimes there's just a, a lack of people that can talk to dual languages, understand the technical issues and the legal issues at the same time, and so be, because this is necessary if you, if you want to write the rules or even read the rules and be able to turn the rules into practical, practically implementable technical measures. And, and again, the, I mean, the, the, the current situation of messaging apps is basically another nice example of fragmentation, which we all do the same thing, but with uh, in very similar interfaces in which the, the color and of the buttons is different because of commercial considerations that tend to keep people closed into their wall gardens of, of the specific app. And But, but the, the problem is that this approach could become more and more of a problem if this platform started to become more controlling. So, the, uh, I mean, especially some of these big, big platforms tend to have a really controlling attitude in the sense that, I mean, we will decide which applications, which third-party software is allowed to run on our devices. And we will charge you for evaluating that, and we will charge you for payments. And will, so, 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 I mean, there is really a, a need to put an end to this, or at least put this under control, if we want to prevent further fragmentation. And uh, the and then there's a third dimension which is often forgotten, especially by policy people, which is fragmentation of the network itself at the technical level, because it's not just a matter of these, uh, let's say, encrypted overlay networks that uh, the platforms are created to. I mean, through adoption encrypt through adopting encryption everywhere. It is really a matter also of networks. I mean, uh, uh, we, we really think of the global internet, but uh, but there's no global internet anymore in a way, in the sense that, uh, that in terms of intercontinental global traffic, now private networks of the big platforms carry up to 75% of the traffic, depending on the study and on, on the evaluation. So, I mean, Google, Meta, all these companies own their own cables and fibers and satellites and whatever to connect their data centers across the, the globe. And most of the traffic just is routed within this private network and not on the public internet anymore. So in a way, there's less and less of a public internet. Uh, and the risk is that in the long term, I mean, the internet is no more because of this kind of approach, because we end up not with one internet, but with like uh, in internet flavors or internet working services like we had in the 90s. We had computer and AOL and they're competing in global private networks. And we could end up having the Microsoft Internet, the Google Internet, and the Meta Internet, and you have to choose to which one you want to subscribe. And they might have the same content to a certain extent, but they may also decide to show you certain websites or not to show you some, or I mean, like it happens today with streaming websites, streaming services, you might, there, there might be some content that is only available in exclusive ways on a specific uh, internet provider. And so th this is the, the, I mean, really a, 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 a troubling direction that, that could realistically happen if this trend is not stopped. So in, in a way, I'd say that uh, platform regulation is really a part of keeping the internet global and open and unique. So it, it's really a part of the internet fragmentation debate. But uh, the, the point, uh, the final point I want to make is that uh, as other speakers were also mentioning, uh, in, <coughs> indeed, platform regulation is, is national or at most regional in nature. And so it introduces internet fragmentation. But this means that fragmentation is not necessarily a negative thing. So in this case, I, I, I think it's actually desirable to have national and regional rules of, of, for content moderation by platforms. And so it's the least bad solution to the, so the situation in which we, we didn't have this kind of uh, regulatory fragmentation in the past. And the only result was to have this kind of global oligopoly never seen before in size. And, and so we, we, I think we understood that we do need some kind of competition rules and antitrust rules over the internet, which affect the platforms. And even if this brings up some fragmentation, then it's fine. And so we, so I'm, I'm a bit worried of all this rhetoric of uh, avoiding internet fragmentation because sometimes it's pushed for business reasons by some of these environments. And of course, the, the, there's this narrative that the internet must be borderless and open, which is at, at the end at the technical level, absolutely valid. and. and and agreeable, but uh, if, if brought up at the content level, then this really means, uh, I mean, we, we are the platforms and we don't want to have rules anywhere in the world. 
and we don't have, want to have to be deal uh, to deal with national jurisdictions. And so this is uh, the final message is that in the end, some kind of fragmentation is, is good, and especially when it, it, it comes to content regulation, it's partly unavoidable due to the difference in values that we have across the world. So the point is, how do we make sure that the, these rules are decided in democratic ways and they are accountable and they are transparent and they are implemented well, but uh, there's no way we can avoid fragmentation and we should not be avoiding it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vittorio. Uh, thank you, uh, Vittorio. Uh, Vittorio gave us a great overview on how internet fragmentation uh, deriving from regulation, from private regulation, from uh, private interests is also, and uh, how it also relates with technical infrastructures. Uh, here in Brazil, we're seeing Starlink projects like uh, entering the country without uh, transparency on the contracts. Meta's project also in Ethiopia, it's really concerning. Uh, so we, we see that the power imbalances between the countries and the, the lack of development infrastructure level and it can also affect digital sovereignty in several levels, uh, but without any, I, I, won't, I don't want to, to extend myself here because we have a uh, few, few time. Uh, so Professor Rolf Weber, uh, it's the next one, uh, it's Professor uh, Rolf Weber, sorry, is the professor of uh, University of Zurich. Uh, I can't, I can unmute him, but I can't uh, make his web, turn his webcam on. I don't know if he is here yet, still. Well, um... Uh, oh, okay. Thank you, uh, Yasmin. I guess you can hear me, but as we yes, you, uh, uh, as we you, uh, uh, I get the reply that host has stopped my video, so you only see uh, my photo and you don't see my face. Maybe my photo is nicer than my uh, face. Anyhow, um, being a relatively late uh, presenter confronts me with a problem that many things which I wanted to mention have already been said. And um, secondly, uh, my presentation on how it works, um, my presentation coming from an academic uh, angle uh, looks uh, more at the structural elements and maybe a little bit uh, less at uh, practical uh, elements. Uh, so um, I have uh, to come back at a couple uh, of aspects uh, which uh, indeed have been discussed before. Uh, let me start with the remark that the title uh, of the document uh, says meaningful and interoperable transparency for digital platforms. Meaningful is relatively uh, clear. Interoperable is of course a term which can be used in very different meanings. We have technical interoperability, we have legal interoperability, and we see some progress at least uh, in the European Union as far as the technical interoperability is concerned. Emma has mentioned uh, Digital Services Act, Victoria um, has mentioned EU uh, policies. I would only like to add in very short words, we also do have interoperability and transparency rules in uh, the Adopted Digital Markets Act as well as in the proposal of the Data Act, but in particular um, we do have interoperability rules on in the regulation on promoting fairness and transparency for business users of online intermediary services, the so-called platform to business regulation. And uh, I think we can come to the conclusion that as far as EU regulations uh, are uh, concerned, uh, somehow gradually um, we are uh, coming ahead um, step by step. But what I would like to add in this uh, context is uh, the following. I think uh, if you talk about technical uh, interoperability, we have to refer to standards. And uh, standards is uh, something which should be uh, developed based on a consensus of a group of interested uh, parties. And in this respect, I would assume that more uh, could be done. I also have the impression that we have not yet deeply uh, discussed the aspect of uh, open standards. Uh, if uh, we would uh, proceed away from uh, silo approaches and 
go more into the direction of um, uh, open uh, standards we would certainly uh, improve the uh, interoperability situation and we would better the interoperability uh, measures only as a side uh, remark at least as far as the academic part is concerned this goes uh, also to nick we uh, do have many more open access uh, rules now in so far we do have access uh, to uh, uh, more data uh, than in the past Let's close now from my side the interoperability discussion and I would like to say a few words also to transparency from the academic side. I would distinguish between, between three forms of uh, uh, transparency, namely the procedural transparency, the decision-making transparency and the substantive uh, transparency. Looking uh, from a uh, backwards, uh, substantive uh, transparency uh, is obviously the most uh, difficult uh, kind and type of uh, transparency because some consensus uh, would have to be reached on material issues such as height speech, height, hate speech or uh, moderation uh, of uh, content and if we, here we do have uh, cultural uh, differences insofar we don't have something like cultural um, globalization then uh, we do uh, have the decision decision making transparency in this uh, context i would like to refer to the uh, multi-stakeholder approach obviously the igf uh, tries uh, uh, to go the way of multi-stakeholderism but it is uh, difficult and uh, consensus of all interested uh, participants uh, in a certain uh, sector uh, is not uh, easily uh, reached. And for example, uh, since we have um, Brazilian uh, moderators and at Mundial 2014 in uh, Sao Paulo has uh, shown how difficult is, it is to really implement the multi-stakeholder uh, approach, everybody on the same level. And uh, finally, um, the first uh, type of transparency, which uh, I mentioned is probably the most legal one, namely the procedural uh, transparency. How can we make uh, sure that due process uh, is uh, in fact complied with? If you give uh, data uh, access, how can it be um, avoided that uh, different uh, people are not uh, treated in an equal way, that we have uh, discriminatory uh, behaviors, etc. And I would also think that it uh, would be worse to be now a little bit more precise to invest uh, more efforts uh, uh, into this part uh, of uh, the transparency when further elaborating uh, on the underlying document of uh, this session. And uh, finally, uh, since uh, I would like to leave some time um, for this uh, caution, I would uh, like to bring up one uh, additional issue, namely, how do we interpret uh, transparency in general as far as information and data is concerned and we do have a paradigm uh, which has been introduced and implemented in particular in financial markets law but also partly in consumer law namely the, um, the mandated disclosure paradigm and at least from the academic side maybe mainly from US uh, academics, but also from some European academics. This mandated disclosure paradigm um, is a contested as viable uh, instrument because uh, the critical uh, voices uh, argue that uh, a lot uh, of uh, information leads to over information and then uh, people are running into confusion effects or into Cassandra uh, effects um, and uh, in uh, addition it could also lead to um, overconfidence uh, which have then uh, the result of uh, not really uh, reflected uh, decisions. So in a nutshell more uh, information, more transparency is not better. And I would somehow like to close the um, uh, circle by referring to the introductory remark uh, 
of uh, Luca. We need more uh, quality uh, of information. We need uh, audit uh, processes. Um, we need uh, somehow supervisory uh, measures which uh, try uh, to foster the quality um, of uh, information. It's probably a long way uh, to go, but I think it's worth to go it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rolf. And uh, yes, indeed, I think that uh, is uh, your last point, especially is essential for us, the need to focus not only on quantity, but also quality of information. And also to this extent, what you also mentioned about the relevance of a multi-stakeholder approach, again, not to merely pay lip service to multi-stakeholder reason, but indeed to have to receive the feedback and standpoints, diverse feedback and standpoints that are uh, indeed necessary to increase the quality of the process, right? And also something that Yasmin was mentioning before, and also Nick was uh, uh, somehow reinforcing the fact that, that most of these uh, this, uh, discussions take uh, take uh, place in very uh, northern hemisphere policy circles. So we really need to try to expand this conversation to global south uh, actors, the 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 coalition, the action coalition, meaningful transparency has also been doing some efforts on this regard together also with the, the, this dynamic coalition of the IGF. So we really have to take into consider the consideration of this importance. And then to keep on the discussion on this point, I would like to introduce our last, but of course, uh, not least speaker, who is Dr. Monica Zanielute, uh, who is senior lecturer at the Australian Research Council and also a senior fellow at the University of Sydney. Monica, it's a great pleasure to have you with us, and please, the floor is yours. And I would like to ask the technical assistance to unmute Dr. Monica Zanyut. I'm not seeing Monica here anymore. Perhaps we have missed her. We have lost her. No, I think it, I think she is here. Uh, I'm trying to ask her to unmute, but I can't turn uh, her camera on. I depend on the host of the session. Have we? Is Monica here and have we unmuted her? Because I'm not seeing her. I see another Monica, but I'm not yeah. seeing Monica as an editor. Okay, so if uh, as we try to find Monica, <laughs> I think we can uh, take advantage of the fact that we have 10 minutes left to start with uh, some questions. I see that there is also uh, some questions in the chat of the uh, on re regard any potential feedback on the recent uh, European Digital Media Observatory Working Group uh, report on platform to researcher data access. Maybe if any of the uh, speakers, all the speakers, of course, both in the first and the second segment of the session, have any. Uh, any uh, questions on these? I'm uh, sorry, any comments on these? You are very welcome. Uh, do we have any others? Uh, before we open the floor for, for uh, well, we open the mic for our, to our speakers for replies. Do we have any question from the floor at this point? Or from any other uh, participant in the chat? Again, we, I'm sorry we cannot see you. So uh, I have to ask you to uh, manifest yourself by taking the mic in the room and saying your name, your affiliation, and your question. Do we have any questions from the floor? I don't see and I don't hear anything so far, but I see a new question. Uh, so Rachel Pollack, uh, I think, so you have a question? You had a question, I hope you have, you have it. Uh, you still have the question. 
in the chat. Uh, let me uh, find. Okay, yes, we found your question. Uh, so, uh, so UNESCO is organizing a global conference in. So maybe you can open the mic of Rachel so that you can ask the question yourself. Uh, I'm opening your mic. So, uh, Rachel, you are now free to ask your question. Uh, yes. Hi, Luca. Um, hello. thank you for, yes, hello. Thank you for the session. Uh, very, very interesting. Um, so my, my comment and then question, um, is to alert everyone that UNESCO is organizing a global conference on regulating digital platforms. Uh, it will take place in Paris from February 21st through 23rd and also virtually uh, in a hybrid format. And the goal of this conference is to develop a model regulatory framework um, for securing information as a public good uh, while respecting freedom of expression. And so transparency is a key element uh, of this framework and also of the conference. Um, I've put in the chat some of the, the goals of, uh, of the regulatory framework um, for transparency, uh, content management policies consistent with human rights, user empowerment mechanisms, uh, accountability, and independent oversight. Um, we also list uh, 10 issues on which platforms should report to regulators. Um, and it's very much in the vein of um, Ofcom's and uh, the Online Safety Bill in the UK and the Digital Services Act in, in terms of focusing on processes and structures. Um, one of the questions that we have now, um, and so this is a, a draft document that's um, being open for consultation. Um, it will be posted online on, on December 9th, um, so we would welcome any comments. Um, and one question that we faced, and I, I think that the session this morning also has, has approached, is um, how, what are the hazards uh, in trying to set out a global policy on regulation, um, given how varied political systems are around the world? Um, and the way that content moderation affects different groups differently um, and, uh, and connected with this idea of interoperability and being nuanced to, to local context as well. Um, so would be very curious uh, for the thoughts of the panelists on this question. Thank you. We have a hand raised. Uh, sorry, I'm not seeing who is raising a hand now. I think it's Rolf. Vittorio, 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 and, no, Vittorio, Vittorio and Anne. Yeah. Sorry, so Victor, so please go ahead, Vittorio, and then Anne. Okay. Yes. Now, so I, I wanted. To, I, mean, I think this is a, a, an important question. I think that the problem is whether we we, we want. I mean, we are talking about hard regulation or soft regulation in this, in, a, in a way. Because I mean, um, most of the platform regulation we are talking about today is, is hard regulation and necessarily will be done at the national level. And indeed, there are risks that in certain regimes, this will be bad for human rights. But I don't see, I mean, how at the global level you can make any kind of um, binding hard level. I mean, maybe you could promote some kind of international treaty, but I, I see it really hard. So what, what could happen at the global level is rather setting principles, or setting suggested frameworks. At the same time, if we, if we want to do that, I think we have to get rid of this rhetoric that, uh, that there has not, there, there should never be any kind of fragmentation or national variation and so on. Because the, the problem in, in having this debate now is that, at least I mean, in the technical community where I, I come from, there's a significant part of the community which is refusing to have this debate and just saying there should be no national rules on content, no national rules on platforms. And this still has to go away before you can have any kind of meaningful dialogue. Right, so we have Emma and then Rolf. Great, yeah, thank you. And um, Rachel, it's it's a great question and really glad that UNESCO is, is going to be hosting this discussion um, in full in February. For me, I think the main hazard in setting a kind of a global framework or a, um, a, you know, a global approach to policy is how different the underlying conditions in different jurisdictions and legal systems are. Um, and so the same regulation in place in a country where there is strong rule of law and clear kind of commitments to human rights and in practice <laughs> achievement of most of those human rights through, you know, respect of those rights through the operation of the court system and the legal system. Um, that kind of regulation can look very different operating in a, a different environment where 
whatever it might say on its face, there's not that kind of fundamental protection for people's rights baked into the overall system. Um, so even just in the question of researcher access to data, um, CDT is working on research right now about even just comparing the US and the EU on the question of does exposing data to third party researchers change the way that law enforcement might get access to that data under legal standards? Very different answer across the, the Atlantic because of how um, both jurisdictions kind of approach the question of reasonable expectation of privacy and what privacy rights you have in your communications data. Um, so I think that kind of comparative overall in legal environment question is really key to understanding the impact that any kind of framework idea um, could could have in practice. Thanks, Emma. Uh, Rolf? Um, okay, thank you very much. I would like to very uh, quickly um, reply to two or three questions. First of all, as far as the UNESCO conference and the earlier question of key is concerned, I think uh, we have to overcome uh, silo solutions and we should uh, broaden somehow media uh, silo and include technical uh, community, uh, include uh, uh, policies in uh, general, include uh, also uh, businesses and uh, try somehow to bring the different uh, streams uh, together in order to be successful. And in, uh, since uh, I'm in the process of speaking, I would also like to quickly answer the questions of Natalia. Rocky principles are not as uh, soft uh, as some uh, people think because Rocky principles have been taken up in the OECD guidelines on multinational uh, enterprises already in 2011 and these guidelines are under revision now and are strengthened so they are becoming relatively hard in many countries and in particular in the European uh, Union the Rocky principles are implemented in regulations or in uh, national laws. So uh, we are in the process of, of making them hard, but uh, obviously um, this is a Western hemisphere uh, approach and I'm, and maybe also an approach uh, in uh, Australia, New Zealand and Japan, but it, it's not the global approach, but I'm relatively confident that we are on the way of making them harder. Thank you so much, Rolf. Uh, Augie? Oh, sorry. Yeah, thank you, Yasmin, and thank you, Rachel, for the for the question. Um, we've we've uh, we've been corresponding in the chat, but yeah, we'd love to follow up on this. Um, I think it's a really important and timely conversation to have, uh, and and your your conference sounds like a great way to to take that forwards. Um, I think to um, to some of the, the, the other points made, I, I would just echo and agree with um, both uh, Vittorio and also Emma. I think we are inevitably seeing a, a divergence of, of different national regimes. I don't think there's anything we can do about that. Um, and I think the, the challenge is how to how to move forward given that. And, and um, some of some of my ideas at the at the start of the session around the sort of underlying uh, regulatory tools being being common across different regimes i think might be might be part of the solution there but um but definitely emma your point is is a really important and um valid one that different different countries with different legal frameworks and uh different sort of starting points in terms of um how how embedded human rights are in in um in in the legal system and the culture i think are really important things to consider at, at the outset as well and um we shouldn't sort of make any naive assumptions around um, around all all being in the same place on those sorts of points. Um, so yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Oli, for this. And I think with the final word of the regulator, we may uh, go towards the end of this session as we are already three minutes out of time. Uh, I think we had a very good discussion with a lot of very interesting elements that will be shared. I hope that the video recording uh, will be uh, accessible soon. And I also hope 
Uh, well, although I really like Nick Suzer, I hope well, there will not only be Nick Suzer's picture <laughs> in the recordings because it may be uh, more entertaining also to uh, watch the entire video recordings of the session. Uh, I think we some uh, other points that for next step that we might find very useful are also engaging in the UNESCO conference that was mentioned by Recho. Uh, UNESCO has been doing great work on these issues and also really feel free both Rachel Guy and, and other friends from UNESCO to use the uh, the document the outcome document we have elaborated this year because it is exactly for this kind of purpose that we have elaborated to have it uh, read and used uh, as much as it possible by partners, friends, and whomever may be interested. So uh, I would say that maybe the next, our next meeting, hopefully, might be uh, in the context of the UNESCO conference in February. Uh, I thank everyone, especially my dear colleague Yasmin, for her excellent co-moderation and my, the, the great panelists that we have had today. It has been really a fantastic discussion and I wish you an excellent uh, continuation of IGF 2022. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Bye-bye.